Hello, we are in conversation today with Chitra Devakarani Banerjee on her latest book, The Forest of Enchantments, which is a deeply layered and rich narration of Sita's version of the Ramayana. And this comes 10 years after the Palace of Illusions, which was a retelling of the Mahabharata. So what made you want to write the stories of these two powerful women? Well, I've been en enchanted by these stories ever since I was little and my grandfather told them to me. But as I grew up and I became a teenager and I started thinking about women in the world, it struck me that the original stories are so male-centered. So I wondered about the women and what they were thinking and feeling as these amazing things were happening around them and to them. And I wanted to fill that empty space by writing something from the woman's point of view so that we get her words her life, her feelings, her triumphs, and her challenges. And that was my enterprise in Palace of Illusions. That's my project in the Forest of Enchantments. What kind of challenges did you face writing about an epic, a retelling of an epic that generations have read and written about? You know, the first thing that's really difficult or a challenge is to find the angle, the angle that is original and yet respectful to the, the texts of Valmiki or the text of Vyasa and actually the many versions that have come before. So what can I do that, to make it original, to make it new and to make it timely so that men and women of today find something in value, a value that they can learn and they can use in their lives by reading Draupadi's life and now especially Sita's life because I think Sita's life has so many challenges and I really wanted to show people how Sita deals with these challenges in a very elegant and courageous manner. I think we all could learn from that. Women need to step out of epics, I feel, to express their real desires and their real choices. And as a reader, I found Sita very human and very real. Sometimes I'm so glad even, to hear that. I'm sometimes good. even more than Draupadi. I'm so glad to hear Your that. Reading. Okay, yes, yes. You know, Draupadi's character was in a way easier to write because she has a very modern temperament. You know, she speaks out. She's not going to put up with nonsense. She sometimes you know, has temper tantrums, whatever. Right? She wants her revenge. But Sita's character is much more nuanced. And I really had to think about who is she? Because I think she is very human. She is very courageous. She goes through amazing ups and downs, and she's never passive. Through the years, we have been shown Sita to be a passive, meek person. That is just not true if you go back to the original story. And that's what I wanted to express in the Forest of Enchantments. She is so amazingly courageous and strong. And she is a woman for today's times. She deals with some really strong Me Too moments and she triumphs over them with her quiet strength. So I'm so glad that that came out for you. And uh, throughout the book, she keeps hearing around her right in the time she's born, who oh, she's a goddess and everybody reveres her. And she keeps wondering. So I would like to think that is your way of saying it is rejecting to be a deity. So she doesn't really accept herself as a goddess. She's like, oh, is that how people really see me? So I think that's I would like to interpret it that way. I think that is a correct interpretation that I wanted to bring out on one hand the very human nature of Sita but I also wanted to bring out on the other hand that all of us have a goddess inside of us. So I want women of today to really read Sita's story and then access the goddess, the strength, the power, the Shakti that is inside all of us. Do you think her story and uh, everybody else, all the other women, it's more relevant right now, not just because of the need to move and everything else is happening in contemporary India, where we are having a revolution of sorts in Kerala with the Shabdimala temple issue. Do you really think yes. that people should look at women and goddesses from epics, real women, and the deification should stop and look at the various stories? Yes, I think it is when we accept women as they are, with all their human flaws and also accept their own particular kinds of strength that helps them to deal with everyday really tough situations 
When we start to respect women that way, we can only have a stronger society. And that is my hope in writing books like Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments. Your Sita dedicates her battle sort to of Udla, like she says she's the unsung warrior in the book. And there are so many women, even Sunna enough, I've not really read about Sita's mother in so much detail as you have brought out. This Tara, this Mandodri, everybody. So how did you blend in all their stories within this narrative? That was a real challenge. But that is what I really wanted to do because so much is already known about the male characters and you know their battles and all that, they have been glorified, they have been sung. But all these women, their quiet lives, right? Urmila, as you said, that is such a tough thing that she had to undergo 14 years by herself in that palace with just, you know, the old folks, right? So I wanted to celebrate all of these different women's stories. I wanted to celebrate the different ways in which women put up with very challenging situations just in everyday life, but nobody gives them credit for it. So I was, my hope is in bringing out these women's stories, the women of today, you know, their struggles will be respected, accepted, understood a little more. You said that the Kriti Bas Ramayana, which you drew inspiration from while writing this book, was actually more sympathetic to Sita than the more popular retellings. Yes. Could you elaborate on that? Yes. I think Kriti Bas, you know, in Bengal, we have a real tradition of Shakti worship, goddess worship. So I think Kriti Bas was influenced by that. And although his Sita is not telling her own story, but he gives a little more space to her and especially the section where she is in Ravan's captivity and she's in the Ashok forest by herself. He has written that very poetically, her pain and her suffering, but through her pain and suffering and loneliness, how strong she is. The Ravan cannot do anything to her. You know, when he comes to see her, she speaks her mind, even though she knows that it'll make her him angry. So I thought that Kritivas was just, you know, he was just applauding Sita's courage through scenes like that. Uh, I found a lot of elements of magic realism across the book, just like the Palace of Illusions and even the title, Palace of Illusions, the Forest of Enchantments, what it's alluding to. And particularly when she's growing up and there's this other world that she's very prescient, she's able to see this other world and the bow, I found all of them very magical. So yes. you really enjoy adding those yes. elements. Yes, I love adding the elements of magic. And really adding is not the right word because in the original Ramayana, we get the sense that the world is not like we think it is. The world does have a layer of magic, a layer of mystery. And I really think that we have that even today in the world. We just have to be, I don't know, we have to be sensitive to it. And when, when we are sensitive to it, that magic that's all around us begins to appear to us, right? So Sita sees things that other people don't see. She relates to the bow and speaks to it, which other people can't do. So I think we all have that capacity to resonate with the magical world. Both Palace of Illusion and the Forest of Enchantment are at its core, I think, a story of love. And Sita keeps trying to understand and define what it is. How would you define it? <laughs> I think as Sita finds out in the novel and right from childhood she's trying to understand love because I think in some ways love is the greatest mystery of our human existence. I think love is just different things at different times to different people and love has a very positive side but also if we are not careful because it's such a strong passion it can make us do a lot of negative things. We see that in Ravan's life in one way, we see that in Dasharat's life in another way, right? And we even see that in Ram's life, finally, in the life of Ram and Sita and their great tragedy. So it is just a power, a mysterious, magical power. <laughs> Your book also talks about the othered, other group here, the Asuras. You talk about the women who have been marginalized. And I also like how you brought out the Asuras and the prejudiced way people see them in, which is very uh, contemporary also, like how we look at race and everything else. So yes. was that like a conscious attempt? Yes, yes. I wanted to see, I wanted to understand it for myself, but also show it in the book, how we are always 
making what we don't understand into the other. And once we make it into the other, that other is not quite human anymore. And so then we don't feel like we don't have to behave towards them like we behave towards our own people. So that idea of the other, and sometimes the woman is the other, sometimes the asura is the other, sometimes, you know, other people in the forests are the other. So I wanted to bring that out. I think that's very contemporary, as you said. And the whole idea of the epic and of love is actually to seize seeing the other, to see everyone as part of ourselves, which really, if we go back into our Hindu beliefs, that is what is at the heart of our religion, to see the whole world as one. Uh, like you were saying in your session earlier at the Litfest, the Shurpanaka episode happens much later, but since we could see it so clearly and you wanted to like finish it off first. <laughs> so uh, how about the Agni Pariksha Oh, the Agni Pariksha episode was very difficult for me to write. I got major writer's block when I was writing that chapter because, you know, it is just, first of all, a painful episode. So, I mean, I had to deal with, you know, I was experiencing all these things as I was writing them. So I had to deal with it the emotionally myself. And I wanted also to bring out the complications, the nuances. So I didn't want to portray Ram as simplistically negative. That's not what he was. It was hard for him to say those things. He says them because he thinks that's his duty as a king. But it's hard for him. I mean, on some level, his heart is breaking as he says it. That's quite clear in even the original. So it was a very tough one to write. I think I kept putting it off. I was like, OK, I'm not ready to write this one. But then at some point, I said, let me write it, and if it's not good, then I'll just rewrite it. And that's how I got over that block. I had to rewrite that scene quite a few times because I really wanted to bring out Sita's power in that scene. Okay, that is one of the most misrepresented scenes because you always hear Agni Pariksha as though Ram tells her, you have to go into the fire to prove your purity. No, Sita decides that. She's going to live or die on her own terms. If Ram does not accept her, she says, light the fire for me. Okay, that's her moment of strength. And then, of course, the gods come and, you know, they speak of her purity. But she's ready. She says, if I can't live on my terms, I'll die on my terms. You know, what strength? So I found Sita a little more questioning than Draupadi. I particularly like this moment. She dreams of Indra. And she's like, oh, Indra, wait. Did you, why, why did you do that to Ahalya? Did Ahalya deserve that? not getting her answer, but she just wants to question. Yes. I really like that. Movie. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I wanted Sita to be the kind of person who approaches the world with a questioning mind, because I think that's very contemporary. And I kind of want to encourage more women to do that. Okay? Because if we don't question, if we just accept the status quo, things will never get better. Not like we have to fight against everything. and be iconoclastic and break things down. But we have to start by questioning, right? We ha because only with questioning does reform and change and improvement occur. So I wanted to see that to be that. So I'm so glad that that came out for you. By writing and reading about these two really powerful women, what are some of your takeaways? And do you find any mix of qualities you like a little bit of? Yes, yes, I like some things about Draupadi and I like some things about Sita. Do you love it? Yeah, I think one of the things I like about Draupadi is, you know, she's quite in control of all her five husbands. <laughs> she's, she's like, I got this, I got this, I know exactly how to behave with each one. But also, she's, she's also very vulnerable. And at the end of her life when she's dying, I think she realizes something that she never realized before, which is who is her real, true best friend. And she realizes that that was Krishna all the time. And so the Draupadi is also, in some ways, the soul in search of God. So she becomes a symbol of all of us, that inner search that we have as spiritual beings. So I think I learned that as I was writing Draupadi's character. One of the things I love best in that book for myself is how the relationship between Krishna and Draupadi continues and grows and evolves until the end of the book. 
And with the Forest of Enchantments, I think a moment of, I mean, challenge, but also interest and surprise for me was the interaction between Ravan and Sita, which is also not as simple as the stories that we've been told. Ravan, bad. Sita, good. No, it's not so simple. The great myths still resonate in us because they don't reduce people to black and white. It's only the popular retellings that do that. So, you know, Sita, even though she's angry with Ravan, she really, you know, hates him for what he's done. She recognizes, and that's her greatness, that he is a wonderful ruler. His people love him. You know, just because he did this one bad thing doesn't mean that he's a bad person. And even his abduction of Sita is in response to what was done to his sister. She sees the chain of events all, all the way until the end when she discovers something about Ravan, which we won't give away here. And Ravan discovers something at the moment of his death about her. So all the stories are about women, inspired by women. You also said the women from your life. Even your fictional characters, you said you resonated with them. So who are some of the writers, women writers, who you love reading and who you yeah. found inspirational? I love reading women writers. They have taught me so much about all of these things that we've talked about. I think, you know, in Bengal, Mahasweta Devi, she has been a big influence just because she is so strong and she brings out injustice against women in society. She just made me see things differently, so I really admire her. Um, in America, Toni Morrison, who's writing about the African-American experience, writes very powerfully about women, how in her society, they're the double minority, they're being you know, attacked from outside of their community and from inside. That's been very powerful. Writers like um, Margaret Atwood, I just love her Handmaid's Tale. You know, she, I just love the imagination and the language. So those are some women writers who have been really powerful for me, yes. I think my hopes for this book is that men and women will both read it. In an ideal situation, men and women will read it together in families, among friends, across generations, and they'll have a discussion about it. They'll have a discussion about the character of Sita, because my hope is that both men and women will learn from all of her wonderful qualities about how to create a better society, a society in which men and women can give strength to each other and can make things better for each other, can be friends. You know, sometimes people say, that oh, you're writing about women and you are writing so much about strong women. Um, what about men? But I think in a society that encourages women to be strong, men are really better off ultimately. It helps us all. And that's my hope that Forest of Enchantments will do that at least to a small degree. Thank you, Chitra, for talking to us. My pleasure.